Remember that I used the NIV. Okay, he said he remembered that. I'm glad somebody has a good memory. I said I have, I've always had a pretty good memory, but my forgetter is getting better every year. In fact, uh, sometimes uh, I don't I don't even remember having forgotten that. But our scripture this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to, unto them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thus ended the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, open our minds and hearts that you may speak to us in this time of worship. For we ask it in your holy name. Amen. Have you ever thought how often we identify with a particular church? On April the 15th of this year, a fire did great damage, did great damage to the Cathedral of Notre Dame. This was, you might say, the heart and state church of the nation of France. If you would look at our National Cathedral in uh, Washington, D.C. and multiply it by 10, you would probably have some idea of the position that this cathedral has in the heart of the French. All distance in France are measured from this building, standing in the middle of a river in the middle of Paris. The cornerstone was laid in 1165. The building was completed in 1345, taking nearly 200 years to build. This church, known as the Lady of Paris, stands at the heart and center of France. It has witnessed over 850 years of French history. It has been adorned, abused, neglected, restored, Threatened with demolition, for nearly nine centuries, it has been sharing the fate of Christianity in France. Ironically, it was in the midst of a 10-year remodeling project. To the best knowledge that they have at the present time, the fire was probably started by an electrical short or by a cigarette thrown away by a workman. I always thought the smoking was probably harmful for you. The, uh, as I said, the rebuilding project was scheduled to take 10 years. 
President Marcon of France has said they're going to rebuild it in five years. And so far, one billion dollars, that's billion with a B, one billion dollars has been pledged to rebuild it. It gives you some idea of the place that this cathedral holds in the heart of the French. Other less known churches hold a special place in the hearts of people. Twice while serving as pastor, I was asked to do hospital visits to men who told me that they were members of the Acresville Methodist Church. At that time, that church had been closed for perhaps 50 years. They knew that, but that was where they grew up, worshiped with their families, had their baptisms and their weddings and the funerals of their loved ones. And though the church was closed, their heart was still there. My home church of Ebenezer was organized in 1848. The log church first built was replaced in the 1880s with the present structure. A church split in 1936 left its numbers decimated. In the early 40s, services were being held every other Sunday afternoon, with attendance running between six and eight people. Most of the families were attending other churches. Although I was only about three or four, my parents wanted me to be in Sunday school, so they attended another church in the morning, but every other week, they were at Ebenezer in the afternoon as part of that six or eight. One Sunday afternoon, Reverend Everett Woodcock, who was later to be a missionary in the Congo, who was the pastor at that time, convened his congregation, and that day it consisted of my dad, my mother, evidently I hadn't been born yet, and Reverend Woodcock. Reverend Woodcock turned to my dad and he says, Michael, what are we going to do? My dad says, we're here. We're going to have church. So they sang the songs. They had these, the uh, prayers. And Reverend Woodcock preached to them the sermon he pre prepared for the day. When I first came to the Cove as pastor, I was told that many years ago, the McConnellsburg pastor held a revival at the AME church, the black church, north of Saito. The 27 men responded. They built the Saito Methodist Episcopal Church. I think the year was 1911. You know the rest of the story. In fact, you know it better than I do. But I became part of that history when... Uh, the um, pavilion uh, had concrete poured, first time I ever tied steel in my life. We tied steel to prepare to pour concrete floor. It was enclosed in to become a fellowship hall. Then sometime, I'm, I'm not sure the sequence of all of these things. Then later Sunday school rooms were added onto the side. And then sometime or other a parsonage was bought, which many at that time said, oh, we never need a parsonage. I say, Believe me, someday you're going to need a parsonage. And then uh, a new church, we finally outgrew the old church, and a new church was built. And how many of you remember in 2002 the first service? 405 people, I checked, because remember each Sunday following, I put the attendance from the Sunday before. 405 people showed up for that first service. I was invited back later for the 100th anniversary of the Saito United Methodist Church. Remember, Bishop Middleton was here, and she made the comment that uh, it was a rarity to see a church with that many people under the age of 40. In fact, you had one of the youngest averages of any church in the conference. You became a station church, your own pastor. You finished the basement. You continued to grow. The church split. But I want to remind you 
that there are chapters yet to be written. And each of you will be an important part of that ongoing story. You're a long ways from writing the last chapter. What is the purpose of a church? Any church. Is there a need for church? I've heard people say over the years, I can worship God at home, outdoors, anywhere. You don't have to go to church. If that is totally true, why have Christians bothered to build sanctuaries over the years? True, the Amish meet in their homes and barns. They have no regular church buildings. Does it make a difference where you worship? Some said, well, I don't have to dress up and I can hear a better service on the television. That may be true. Do those people know you? Are they going to encourage you in time of difficulty? Is the pastor going to baptize your kids, marry your young, and bury your old? The TV may have an excellent service, but isn't it almost like looking through the window of a restaurant and watching other people eat? Somehow you're not part of what's going on. <coughs> In the gospel that I read for you, Thomas failed to meet with the other disciples because of a crisis of faith. Remember when Jesus met with the disciples the first time, they said they saw the nail prints in his hands and, in, and the, uh, where he was, uh, had been thrust in his side? But Thomas says, I will not believe. After all, I saw him die. It's over. We're finished. I said, perhaps I have a uh, strange way of picking heroes. I always liked Thomas. Because no one pulled anything over on Thomas. Thomas says, the rest of you may think that you saw Jesus, but I, unless I see it, unless I experience it, unless I know it firsthand, I'm not going to buy into this. Unless I see the nail prints. Unless I put out my hand to his side, I will not believe. One reason we meet is to help each other through the difficult times. Why is it that Thomas, and by extension, sometimes the rest of us, in our time of need, fall away? When we need the church the most, then we tend to fall away. That makes about as much sense as saying, I'm too sick to go to the doctor. Or I won't go into the hospital because I'm sick. But Thomas, in his time of need, <coughs> separated himself from the rest of the disciples. Other reasons for gathering. The book of Hebrews says, Don't neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. We are told in the early church they looked to the leader during the benediction. You know, normally when we have the benediction, we bow our head and uh, we do it that way. But in the early church, when the leader gave the benediction, they looked at the leader. They did not bow, nor did they close their eyes, because they faced persecution, possibly the forfeiture of their property because they were Christian, even death. They needed all the encouragement they could get. <coughs> And Phyllis will tell me, why don't you put your cough drop in? Phyllis, I already have it in. This is not working. <laughs> I do have water. Thank you, Sharon. Excuse me for a moment. The early Methodist circuit riding preachers met annually in conference. One song that they always sang was, And Are We Yet Alive? It's found in your hymnal on page 553. And for good reason did they sing this hymn. Because few of them lived beyond 36 years of age. Because of the hardships they endured on the frontier. They were appointed one year at a time. Some of them, it would take them uh, maybe up to 12 weeks to make their circuit. So you only get back to the uh, one church four times in a year. 
so it was said that a circuit rider really only needed four good sermons because by the time he preached his four sermons, by the next year he's moved to another circuit. And some said sometimes the weather was so bad, the only thing that would be out would be buzzards and Methodist preachers. They gave their life to spread the gospel across the new land. So again, one reason for coming together is to encourage one another. Church is not a gathering of the perfect. It is a gathering of those of us who are willing to admit that we don't always have it all together. I like to say it is not a country club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. We come together not because we have arrived, but because we're still on the way. And there's a few bumps and scrapes and difficulties along the way. And so we come together to be strengthened and to be encouraged. We pray for one another and encourage one another and hopefully tell others that they too can enjoy what we have found. The church doesn't have perfect leaders either. Jesus did not anticipate perfect leaders. Peter was impetuous. He frequently spoke and acted before he thought. James and John were known as sons of thunder. With a nickname like that, we can gather that they had a pretty good hot temper. In fact, remember the time when a Samaritan village didn't receive them and they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? These two fellows were disciples. Matthew was a tax collector for the hated Roman government. And Simon the Zealot, who was also a disciple, was a revolutionary who wanted to overthrow the Roman government. I bet they had some interesting political discussions at the end of the day. And Judas, of all people, was the treasurer of the group. And he was dipping into the till. And although Peter was perceived the leader of the disciples, Jesus predicted that Peter would fail. You know, Peter says, Lord, I'll go with you wherever. I'll die for you. And... Jesus said, before the cock crows, you have denied three times that you ever knew me. How many times, perhaps, by our actions or by our words, have we sometimes left him down and denied him? But he told Peter, once you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Those more mature in the faith are to be mentors to new Christians and those weaker in their faith. You know, in every congregation, it's not your age that determines your Christian maturity, but perhaps how long you've been in the struggle, how long you've been in the faith. And so those who are older in the faith, more mature, are supposed to encourage the weaker. I'll give you an example. If you're trying to teach a child to walk. When it falls, do you say, dumb kid, never thought you'd learn how to walk? No, you pick it up and brush it off and encourage it. Is that not what we're supposed to do to each other? Encourage one another. Say, okay, you fouled up. We've all fouled up sometime or other. Encourage them in the faith. In the early Methodist church, the class meeting was an important part of the congregation. It was made up of 12 members and a leader. They studied together each week and held each other accountable. Today, probably the closest thing we come to it is having a buddy system. I don't know whether Saito has a buddy system or not. If it works, what you do is pair two people in the congregation, and they're supposed to keep track of each other, remembering each other in prayer supporting each other, and if the other one doesn't show up for church, call and say, hey, are you sick, or are you on vacation, or what's going on, and and uh, be of encouragement to one another. In fact, it's a good idea to uh, have an intergenerational, and maybe an old established Christian, and one who's newer in the faith, because of that dynamics that can take place. Christianity needs community. How do you break a rope? You unravel it. How do you destroy a church? You loosen the bond that binds. 
Phyllis and I attended a seminar in Lancaster here several weeks ago, and one of the presenters was a professor of church history from United Theological Seminary. And he told us, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the family, what's wrong with the church, <coughs> and by extension, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with the nation. I was all ears. I was expecting something deep, complicated, and profound. He said, you know what's wrong with this country? You know what's wrong with families nowadays? It's the loss of the kitchen table. Think about it. He said, families don't sit together around the table and eat and converse. They have an Allen in the middle where they grab food and go their separate ways. He said, the kitchen table is where you share stories of your life, what is important to the family, your values. And for those of you who are older, you remember the time when the kitchen table was where, or around the kitchen was where everybody visited. Family came to the kitchen door. <coughs> family visited in the kitchen. Family gathered around the table. Fam that is where family got together. So he said, the problem that we have in our society today is people don't communicate. You need to be able to communicate. That's where children pick up what the values of this family are. They pick up what your values are, what's important to you, where you share concerns. As the disciples met in the upper room, the doors were closed. That had significance. Their leader had just been executed. They feared arrest. They had lost control of the events that surrounded their lives. Loss of control brings fear. <coughs> uncertainty. In a time of uncertainty, we want to hold on something that is stable and secure. Do you remember 9-11? After the attack on 9-11, we saw a significant increase in church attendance for a couple of weeks. And after people decided that, well, there's really not going to be any follow-up, we really don't need a church anymore. They fell away. Jesus gave his disciples, and by extension us, a very important mandate. He gave them a great commission. He said, go. He gave them authority. You are my representatives. And he gave them power. He said, the Holy Spirit will be with you. Our effectiveness as we reach out to this community with the gospel of Christ may depend on what part of the Holy Week we emphasize. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He took our punishment. That is the story of Good Friday. That is an important message, a message we should declare, but do we stop there? Do we have a good, dead Savior? The world has produced many great people, great teachers, Great liber liber liberators who are now dead. We honor them by building monuments. We honor the place where they're buried. But our story doesn't stop there. We are an Easter people. Jesus conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave. He arose. Because he lives, we too have the hope of eternal life. The early church started to come together on the first day of the week, celebrating Easter anew every Sunday. We celebrated Easter last Sunday, and we're celebrating Easter again this Sunday. And Lord willing, we'll celebrate Easter again next Sunday. And the Lord willing, we will celebrate Easter until he's coming again, because that defines who we are. We believe in a risen Lord. The story of Easter is one of victory. The body may die, but our hope is in one who lives. And because he lives, we shall live also. Isn't that good news? Perhaps you ought to tell someone. Let us pray. For God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will help us, each of us, to realize that we are Easter people. Yes, we follow one who died for our sins. We also follow one who lives again. And because he lives, 
we have the hope of eternal life. Bless, we pray. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.